were so limited and they accomplished so much. If we fast forward in history a little bit, um, yeah, uh, this is uh, Gothic Cathedral, Notre Dame. Uh, it took 182 years to build this structure from start to finish. That's like several human lifetimes, especially, especially in the 13th century. Um, and, and it was done without computer-aided design, and it was done without modern metallurgy. Uh, the tools that humanity had at the time to build something like this were incredibly limited, and yet we did it. <laughs> I mean, not us you know, personally, but, but as a species, we have accomplished so much, uh, even given the limited tools that we had. So let's fast forward again. Let's go just past the, the birth of computers. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is one of the first computers, uh, Jean Hall, uh, like many of the women who invented programming, she programmed computers by flipping switches according to a book. And she would do that over and over again. Uh, and that's how you program computers. If that's how I had to program a computer, I would not be a programmer. Uh, I, I would find something that was easier, because that is hard. That's hard work. Uh, and yet, you know, it was able to calculate, you know, missile trajectories and all sorts of really difficult math that would take days for humans to calculate by, by hand with slide rules, and it was able to do it in mere minutes. Uh, you know, really impressive stuff. Fast forward a little bit more, humans invent this thing called assembly. Uh, basically, instead of flipping switches, we had something that looked like words, little three or four digit, uh, you know, LDAA, which means load accumulator A acronyms, basically. And this is how we could program computers. It was tedious and it was ridiculous because you had to write thousands of lines of this in order to do anything, even basic. Uh, and yet, we did a lot with assembly. Uh, not only were the first operating systems written with it, uh, we went to the moon with it. <laughs> this is the, the lead uh, programmer on the Apollo Guidance computer program standing next to the software printout of the Apollo computer guidance uh, program that, you know, they wrote. This is the software that humanity went to the moon with and came back. That's incredible. I mean, if you think about the limited systems that were on the, the actual Apollo space module, uh, there's no like, preemptive multitasking, like things that we take for granted now, they did not have. As astronauts were, were flipping switches and they were uh, you know, accessing hex addresses in memory and manually changing them to operate their spaceship. Cool. <laughs> that, you know, that's incredible. Again, humans did so much with so little. So that kind of brings us to today, you know. We have amazing things. We have the internet, distributed computing, cloud computing. Um, I can create a, a virtual computer, whatever that means, somewhere in the world, I don't care, and it can run Bitcoin mining or whatever I want it to run uh, like that. It's, it's so easy, it's trivial. Um, but what are the software builders in the future gonna think of what we do now? In 100 years, are we still going to be building software using a text editor? I hope not. And I would like to think that the, uh, the people building software in 100 years will be kind and generous to us. And I hope that they will look back on us and see what we've built and say, wow, that's amazing. Uh, I can't believe that we did so much with so little. But I'm not really here to talk about how we're going to build software in 100 years. I'm not even here really to talk about how we're going to build software tomorrow. I'm talking about how we're going to build it today. So let's talk about an agenda. I'm going to talk about three major things. First, I want to clarify that simplicity is the goal of programming. It sounds obvious, but we're going to go into it in a little bit of detail to make sure that we're all on the same page about what simplicity means and what it means to program. Second. We're going to talk about how statefulness is an enemy of simplicity. What does statefulness mean? How does it impact the complexity of our programs? And finally, we're going to talk about how functional reactive programming conceals the state of a program rather than try to eliminate it. 
And we're going to talk about why that is a, a good decision rather than trying to get rid of state altogether. So, simplicity. I, I think it's important to start with a, a, a definition. Um, simplicity is the goal of programming. If we're going to talk about simplicity, what does it mean to be simple? Uh, simple means... Uh-oh. <laughs> simple means... I'm finding my own slides now. There we go. Oh, it's over here. Okay. Uh, simple means it's focused. It has one goal, one purpose, one motivation. Uh, it doesn't have to do just one, one like, task, but it only needs to deal with one concept. If it deals more than that, it's, it's complex. If it combines things, it's complex. And uh, I think this is really interesting because simple is not necessarily easy. And these are two terms that uh, we use interchangeably a lot. Um, the author of Closure, Richicki, has a great talk called Simple Made Easy uh, back in 2011. Uh, really great talk if you want to go into it. Um, I'm just going to briefly cover it. I can't really do the topic justice. But essentially, simple is something that we can objectively measure. We can say whether or not this is simple or not because it, it deals with more than one concept. Uh, easy is subjective. Easy means different things to different people. Something is easy if it's familiar. So, this is some code that I would expect most first year computer science students to be able to write, be able to read. We have an array of numbers. We start out with a, a variable called sum. We set it to zero. Uh, we write a for loop for uh, i is equal to zero because that's how we iterate through arrays. Uh, while i is less than the numbers dot count, that's the length of the array. Uh, increase i every step, and we take the sum and we add whatever number is at the specific index, and then at the end we can print the sum. This is pretty easy code. Uh, it's not uh, it's not something that I would expect uh, anyone here to, to really struggle to grasp um, because it's something you've probably done before. But is it simple? I don't know. We've got uh, a variable that keeps a running sum until it's done. We need to know how to start and go through the array exactly once at each index. We need to know when to stop and how to advance the index, how to get something out of it. That's not simple. That's many concepts. So by contrast, this is something that I would say is simple. It's the same numbers array. And we say reduce the array of numbers down to a single number using addition starting at zero. That's what that line means. Now that may not be easy if you've not used the reduce function before, and that's okay because ease is relative. With practice, with exposure to this kind of terminology and, and these functions, this can become easy. And this is really important because, as I said, ease is relative and it's very difficult for us to write programs in order to make them as easy as possible. That's difficult to do, uh, but we can make them as simple as possible, and that's something that uh, we can all agree on what simplicity means. Okay. Okay. So is that simpler? Is it easier? I'd say yes, it is simpler. Is it easier? That depends. Simple is the opposite of complex. Uh, if something is complex, it means it's many things. It has many purposes. It does uh, things with many concepts. It's very combined. Uh, but there's two types of complexity. The first is called incidental complexity, and the second is essential complexity. And uh, this was first established in uh, the 80s in a paper called uh, no, Sil no Silver Bullet. Uh, and the idea was, how can we make it easier to write software? How can we make writing software faster? And these were questions that were very unanswered in the 1980s. Uh, and so, oh, I'd say they're still not answered today. Uh, so incidental complexity is complexity that relates to how we solve a problem. Essential complexity is complexity that relates to the problem itself. So in our previous example, when we had the sums of the two arrays, we would say that the essential complexity would be addition, starting at zero, combining an array into something. 
incidental complexity would be state, how to go through an array, how to grab things out of an array. That's incidental complexity that, that doesn't need to be there. And this is really interesting because if we have a problem we're trying to solve with computers, and most of the time when we write a program we're trying to solve a problem in the real world, uh, it's very difficult to reduce the essential complexity of a problem because it's essential to the problem. But incidental complexity can be reduced. Incidental complexity is governed by how we choose to solve the problem. And if we can make smarter choices, then we can reduce that incidental complexity. So the goal of computer programming is to write simple code. And we do that by minimizing the incidental complexity. So if we want to be smart about how we write our code, we need to think about how what we write impacts the incidental complexity of our code. Easy doesn't scale. Because even though something may be easy to read, or sorry, easy to write once, we don't uh, you know, write code many times. Often we'll write one piece of code and then we'll go back and read it in a week and then a month later. We'll read it over and over again. We'll modify it all the time. We only really write it once, but we read it many times. And if we have to think about what everything does and all of these different concepts, that doesn't scale well. So we get, we get to choose. Do we want something that's easy to write or simple to read? I would much rather go with simple to read. Uh, I love this quote from the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. Uh, this is from the preface. Uh, this is just from like, you know, <laughs> things that you need to know in order to read this book. Programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And I love this because it tells us something really profound about uh, the craft of programming. If writing programs is about writing something to be read by humans, then programming is really a form of communication. Not with a machine, but with people. And I think this is, this is really profound because we have a stereotype of programmers who are loners and who are isolated and who don't interact with others unless they have to. But programming is about communicating with people. Programming is a social activity by its own nature. That's an aside. Uh, so let's continue on with simplicity. Okay, let's look at an example of uh, simplicity versus complexity. Uh, we have a form validation logic, some form, we don't know what it is. The requirements come through that we're, when given a form, we need to validate it. And uh, the submit button for the form should be enabled when the form is valid and disabled when it's invalid, okay? Second requirement, the submit button should be disabled while the form is being sent and then enabled again at the end. So let's go through what this might look like in a typical iOS application. Here's our view controller. Uh, we've got some callback. Form did change, so the form has changed. All right, well, let's set the enabled state to be the, the whether or not the form is valid. Call the validate function on the form, okay? Later on, we've got a, a submit form function. This is the form, uh, this is the function that actually submits or, or, or is, is told to submit the form over the internet. And first we set the button enabled to false, like we're supposed to. And then we submit the form and we get a callback closure. Uh, when the form has finished being submitted, we re-enable it, right? Eh, I don't know. Just because we've submitted a form, does that mean that the form is valid? I didn't see that in the requirements, so I'm gonna put in to validate the form in our completion block. Uh, and now, when the submission is completed, we'll revalidate. Another question is really, you know, are we supposed to reset the form after it's submitted? I don't know, the requirements didn't say so. Maybe. So we haven't even finished writing our first example and we've run into some complexity. And the complexity surrounds whether or not the enabled state of the button should be true or false. Should the button be enabled or disabled? And I think that the complexity here, the incidental complexity, is around managing that state. Is it enabled, is it not? Should it be, should it not be? So let's try another approach. Let's simplify things. 
Okay. So here we've got a handler object. It's a form handler. Uh, we give it a callback. A callback. Uh, it tells us whether or not the button should be enabled. And we enable or disable the button in exactly one spot. And now we've isolated where we manage our state to one spot. Uh, when the form changes, we tell the handler to, you know, hey, the form is updated. When we submit the form, we've told the handler to submit the form. Our view controller, where this code lives, got a lot simpler because it no longer has to deal with submitting things or validating things or anything. All it does is uh, delegate all of that logic out to the form handler and it's responsible for a callback whether or not the button should be enabled. That's it. This view controller now has one purpose. Awesome. It is simple. Uh, and you're kind of probably wondering, you know, what does that form handler look like? We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> okay. So in the original example, we're managing state in three places. That is incidental complexity because we have to manage whether or not the button is enabled in three different places. Now, is the button's enabled state and how we deal with that, is that essential to the problem of form validation? No, because I just demonstrated that we can write code that uh, doesn't do that, that isolates the state. So it must not be essential to the problem because we were able to solve the problem without it. So state really led us to the incidental complexity that we had. The lesson I'm trying to get at here is we should make things simple by trying to avoid state specifically avoid uh, anything to do with it. Uh, managing state is the sort of term that I use. That means accessing what the current state is and changing the state. Either one, either reading or writing. Okay, I've been using this word a lot and this is thrown around quite a bit by functional programmers online and uh, other advocates of um, not state. Uh, I'd like to talk about what it actually means a little bit because unless we have a common vocabulary that we can use to discuss programming, I'm not sure that we can have a meaningful conversation. So what is state even? I mean, like, let's, let's start with the definition here. Um, broadly, uh, cur the state is the current values of any accessible variables. This is sort of a broad definition. Uh, I tried to pick the one that the fewest people would disagree with. Um, I think I've done pretty good. So what I'm saying here is if you have a global variable that you can access, that is included in part of your state. If you have a local variable or property in an object, that's included in part of your state too. Uh, if you can't access a variable, then it's not in your state because you don't have access to it. So the problem with state is how it scales. Let's start with the simplest variable we, we can have, which is a Boolean, true or false. Uh, if we have one Boolean in our state, then we have up to two possible states. If we have two Booleans, it's up to four possible states. If we have three Booleans, it's eight. You can see where this is going, uh, 16, 32, so on. Um, and there's a really interesting thing. Psychology tells us that uh, humans' working memory, which is about equivalent to uh, RAM, uh, the amount of things that we can hold in our mind at once and be able to uh, function with all of those things without forgetting any one of them is seven, plus or minus two, depending on the person, depending on their mood. Uh, so that means we get up to three booleans. There's not a lot of problems that you can solve with just three booleans. Not many at all. Uh, so if we're managing all this state, um, and we have more booleans than, more, more variables than we have capacity to think about, then we're not able to uh, keep the entire execution of our code in our head at once. We can't think about what our code does in its entirety because it's doing too much. It's just not something that our brains are, are capable of doing. The problem with state really is that it changes. If all those Booleans stayed the same and never changed, that'd be wonderful. Uh, but unfortunately, state tends to change. An example from iOS, whether or not you're showing the status bar, like that's global state that uh, the Apple engineers who wrote UIKit introduced for us. And there's nothing we can do to avoid that state. It's there uh, and it changes. And if we're writing our code to rely on that state or to access that state, then that's incidental complexity to our application that we 
might not have had to deal with in an ideal world. Okay, so managing state is incidental complexity. Managing means either accessing state or changing state. Either one of those introduces complexity to your application that isn't essential to solving the problem. So let's look at our form handler. This is a lot of code, don't worry, we'll go through it line by line. Uh, the, the form handler class that we used in our uh, previous example. Remember I shoved all that logic elsewhere. I said, ah, I'll just give it a callback, it'll be fine. All right, so this is, this is that. This is that class. It's got one public uh, property, it's a callback, uh, providing a bool and uh, no return function. Uh, it's got three private properties, uh, something to submit a form, something to validate a form, and something to reset a form. And finally, it has an initializer, uh, given a callback. That's exactly what we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so this is pretty limited. It's not really doing anything yet. Let's see what it might look like. How might we invoke the callback? Oh my goodness, <laughs> okay. Whew. Your initial reaction to that might have actually been, oh my god, all those classes. I mean, first I've introduced this form handler thing, and I haven't really explained why yet, and now inside the form handler, I've got three other things, and what do they do? Oh my god, I don't know. And, and that's a totally natural rela reaction. Relax, it's gonna be okay. If you're used to writing things out like we had in the original view controller, that's easy to you, but it's not simple. This is simpler, but it might be difficult, and that's okay. Everyone has trouble with this at first. What I would say to someone who objects and says, there are too many classes, uh, no. Uh, if you have many classes, if you have them well named, well organized, well tested, and they all are simple, then I would argue that's better than having the same amount of uh, essential complexity plus a bunch of incidental complexity that you don't need by doing everything in one spot. Um, this is something that like, I'm seeing a lot of people like not really care so much about having lots of classes, which is awesome. Typical iOS developers would see that and think, oh, it's too many classes. Uh, no, I just want everything in one file. So maybe you're all more enlightened than the, the typical uh, audience I'm used to. So congratulations. All right, what do those classes do? Here's a private function. It invokes the callback. It invokes it with uh, a property, or sorry, a, a parameter, true or false. Uh, if the form is submitting, then we should disable the button. Uh, if the form is invalid, we should disable the button. That's what this logic does. We've isolated the whether or not to enable the button or disable the button to one spot. Now we can call this private function throughout the rest of our class. Uh, the validate function, uh, when our form is updated, it just invokes the callback. And again, we've isolated the logic there in one spot. And finally, we have the submit. Woo, look at all this code, okay. Let's go through this line by line. Uh, we have got a submitter, and we're calling the submit function on it, we're giving it the form to submit, and we're saying, uh, when you start submitting, let me know with this callback. And then I'll just invoke my callback block. I'll say, hey, callback block, check and see if it's submitting, and make it false if you are. Uh, when you're done submitting, invoke this. And I'll ask the resetter, hey, can you reset the form if you, if you should? I don't know yet, but uh, you, know, you should do it. Again, I don't know whether or not I should reset the form, but I'm isolating that into one spot. And finally, I invoke the callback. I like this. Uh, how much state do we have in our form handler? None. <laughs> uh, we've actually obviated all the state, and the only state is in our setter. This is the form handler uh, declaration I told you beforehand. All of these are lets, that means they can't be changed. We can't change to a new callback. We can't change our submitter or our resetter. Uh, there's no state in this. The only state is in our uh, submitter. And that's interesting because when you think about it, submitting a form over the internet uh, takes time. I mean, the round trip, at least one round trip is necessary to send the data to the server and receive a response whether or not that data has been uh, received. Uh, that state of whether or not it's being submitted is essential to the problem of sending things over the internet. 
So there's not a lot more incidental complexity that we can reduce, and the only state we have is necessary. It's essential to the problem that we're solving. So I would say this is great. We've got state contained in the submitter. Fantastic. I don't have to deal with it. Uh, and I'd like to point out this is not a pedagogical example. This whole form handler idea, this isn't like something, I mean, it is something that I typed up for the slides, but it is something that I would ship. I would ship this code after I um, wrote some unit tests. Uh, because testing is very important. Another thing that iOS developers don't agree on, I don't know why. Um, this is not code that's just to show you why state is bad. It's actual code that I would actually write. We have a simpler view controller. It only has uh, the form handler, and the form handler deals with all of everything for us. The view controller has no idea what's going on inside there. We've isolated the state to just the submitter. That's great. We've isolated all of our central complexity. So, state doesn't scale. Why? Because our brains don't scale. Unfortunately, there's not a lot that uh, we humans can do to upgrade the capacity of our brains. Uh, it's just not, not within the current realm of possibility. All right. All of that is the preamble to talk about what I really want to talk about, which is functional reactive programming. Uh, FRP, that's what it stands for. Um, I actually don't think I have the words functional reactive programming anywhere in my slides, but that's what FRP stands for. So let's take a look at what it is. Functional programming is uh, a solution to this problem. If state is so bad, then why don't we remove it? And the problem is, you can't. <laughs> uh, because most computer programs are written for the real world, and the real world has state. Uh, when we change that button to be enabled or not, that changes the physical pixels on the screen. The state of a physical object changes because our code told it to, and that state is incredibly, incredibly difficult to remove completely from our, uh, uh, our computer model. Uh, now, Haskell programmers might disagree, uh, and they get really frustrated that state exists uh, in the real world, but there's nothing we can really do about it. <clears throat> so if we can't remove state, what can we do? And the answer is, is sort of in what we talked about with the form handler. If we can't remove state, we can conceal it. We can hide it. We can isolate it. We'd like to use an abstraction because as much as I like the example before with the form handler, uh, there was a little bit of boilerplate. There was some stuff that we had to do that's not essential to solving the problem. So that's complexity that I'd like to further get rid of. And I'd like to use a higher level of abstraction than just closures. Um, Dijkstra, one of the most prolific computer scientists in history, uh, said the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. I love this idea because it lets us know that, um, I mean, like, we shouldn't just take, I'm not trying to, like, appeal to authority fallacy, but uh, Dijkstra was pretty smart, and uh, I happen to really agree with this ideal. Uh, I'd like to work at an abstraction where I don't have to worry about state. I like to work in an abstraction that hides state for me, and that's what FRP is. Here's a very simple couple pieces of Swift. We've got a login status. It's set to not log in. It's a variable. Uh, later on, something changes it to be logged in. Uh, we'd like to be notified when this changes, but unfortunately, Swift doesn't have a built-in general purpose observation mechanism. Objective-C did. It was called KVO. We don't have that in Swift. So we could have a callback block, and we'd have to remember to call the callback block, uh, which is incidental complexity. Uh, if we want more than one observation, then we need to have an array of callback blocks. If we want to add a callback after we initialize it, that's changing the array or removing one. Now we're managing state, and we're right back where we started. <laughs> so what can we do instead? Well, this is the solution that FRP presents us with. Instead of having a variable wrap the login status in a capital V variable, we say this generic object holds a login status, and we can change the value of that object. 
And you're probably thinking, okay, but why? <laughs> like, oh my goodness, you had var here, and now it's let, and this is a variable. Big deal. Okay, well, this gets us a lot. Let's take a look at a, a login network example. Uh, we have a, a, sorry, login network model. Uh, it has a private variable that holds a login, logged in status. Uh, logged in, not logged in, that kind of thing. Its initial value is not logged in, and it's private, which means that nothing outside the class can actually access it. I mean, like, access it. Like, it can't read it or write it. Uh, now we have a public variable called login status, sorry, public property. It's a computer property. So anytime someone accesses this, it's going to return our private one dot as observable. And that's going to create a sort of read only version of it. What this returns won't be able to change the value of the login status. It won't even be able to ask what is the current login status. The only thing the observable can do is react to the state change. We'll see what that looks like in a little bit. Right. OK. So what we've done is concealed the state, not only within the class, but within a specific member of the class, uh, which is great. I like to conceal state because state leads to incidental complexity. So how would we use this? Well, the first thing we would need to do is access the actual property. That's the computed property, not the private one, but the computed one. And this is read only. I can't ask it what the current state is. Instead, I can subscribe to state changes and say, when the login status change, give me the result of that change. And if it's logged in, then I'll welcome the user. And if it's not logged in, then I'll tell them that the login didn't work. And that's it. That's how we would write this uh, in our view controller. OK. The view controller no longer has access to the state. It can't say what is the login status. It can't say the login status is now whatever. It just can't. It can only react to changes in the state. And this is a really important point. That's why I keep saying it. Uh, and the, the reactions are often functional uh, in the way that you're given a result and you do something with it. Uh, if you're given the same result, you do the same thing with it. All right. So the question is, really, why use a variable? I mean, with our original example with the login network model, uh, we stored our state in there. But we're sort of relying on the fact that someone else is going to call a, a login function that changes the state for us. And that's really uh, adding some incidental complexity. So let's get rid of the variable altogether. altogether. Let's define, Let's redefine our, our login network model to have a function called login with username and password. And this returns an observable itself. It's an observable of a user status. Uh, and uh, we rely on this network dot auth username and password. This is going to return an observable of a network response. And then we just need to turn that response into whatever we want. In this case, let's turn it into first the status code and then check is the status code 200 then return that we're logged in. Anything else, we're not logged in. And now we've gotten rid of the variable altogether. No one has access to the current state of whether or not the user is logged in or not, and we're forcing everybody to only react to state changes. Yes. We've gotten rid of state-ish uh, by creating a, a system where we only react to changes in state rather than accessing the current state. This has decreased the incidental complexity of our login network model because it no longer has a variable. You may have noticed the network access in the observable. Remember I called network.auth whatever? Uh, that's actually going to return an observable with a network response in it. A really common mistake that people make when they start out with this kind of thing is that in order to get the network call to be made, you need to subscribe to the actual observable. Otherwise, nothing will happen. Generally, that's how it works. Um, so uh, from an outside perspective, let's look at the view controller. We've got our login function that we're calling. Uh, it's going to return an observable of logged in or not logged in. And we subscribe to that just like we did before. Uh, none of the rest of the code is, has changed. Uh, seems like magic. Sure does. I love it. It's great. OK. So like I said with the network example, subscribing to an observable starts it. Um, there are some exceptions to this, but generally, this is, this is how it works. If you don't subscribe to an observable, the observable doesn't do anything. It doesn't send any events unless someone's listening to them. 
Okay. <clears throat> Subscribing returns a disposable. This is really interesting because sometimes we want to no longer subscribe. We, we were subscribing, now we don't care anymore. We want to forget about it. Uh, this would be the, the kind of thing of removing a callback block, but that would be managing state. Uh, and we have a disposable, we can manage it manually. Ew, no, that's managing state. This is the whole point. We're trying, to get a, we're trying to get away from that idea of managing state ourselves. So instead, let's tie the disposal of those subscriptions to object deallocation. So whenever our view controller is deallocated, we want the subscriptions that it has to, to be disposed of. And there's a mechanism in FRP to do this called a dispose bag. We add the property to our view controller. Uh, when the view controller is deallocated, the dispose bag will be deallocated. And when the dispose bag is deallocated, everything inside of it will be disposed of. Then all we need to do is make sure to add our subscriptions to the dispose bag. And that's really easy because Swift, the compiler, will warn us if we forget to do this, which is amazing. Uh, this is what I meant when I said uh, Swift made doing FRP a lot easier than Objective-C did. So that's great. Uh, we've got a subscription that lasts as long as we do. Uh, no magic memory management. It's, it's explicitly here. Okay, cool. What else? Let's, let's do some more. All right. Requirements change. I mean, have you ever been working on a project and all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, we need to do this other thing instead? Well, that just happened, but in the talk. Okay. So now instead of just getting access to whether or not we're logged in or not, we need access to the full user model. Maybe their avatar or their, you know, whatever. Okay, so let's modify the network model that returns. Remember before it was returning user status, now we want it to return a user. So what the changes would look like are just this. First we change the type of the observable to be user, and then we take out the status code stuff and we turn it into this. Uh, we filter successful status codes, we try to map the result, the response from the network into some JSON, and then we try to map that JSON into a user object. And we do all that using three lines of code. Uh, now these are like, this is code that I've written and tucked away somewhere else, but it's reusable code. And I don't need to be worried about how JSON parsing, how JSON parsing works in this specific case. I can just access that reusable uh, operator. So we're calling auth username just like we were before. We're getting a network response, but instead of accessing the status code, we're filtering by the status codes, mapping into JSON, mapping into user model. If any of those things changes, then the observable does what's called uh, produce an error. Uh, an error is like, um, well, you know what an error is. It's an error. What would that look like? How would we handle the error? It's actually fairly straightforward. Back when we we're using this, this login function, we would say, on an error, handle the error. And that's it. Um, in fact, this is a better model than what we were doing before because say the network call before failed, uh, like the user went offline or something, then we would be producing an error and not handling it. So this is something you generally would want to do with, uh, with network calls. Okay, that's really neat. Thank you. Uh, one more thing, quick example. Again, I'm just trying to give you a taste of, of uh, now, now that we have a common vocabulary to speak about FRP, you know, what are some of the other things it could do? Okay, so this is a lot of code. Let's go through it one, one by one. Yeah, okay. So we've got an access token property. It returns an observable of an access token. Uh, say this is OAuth, right? Oh, OAuth. Okay, so we, we need to make sure that our access token is valid before we actually call our API. So we get our access token and it returns an observable. So we can't ask what is the access token. We can only react to when we get it. So we get the access token and we switch. Is it expired? Well, then get a new one, and the fetch access token is a new observable that sends us a new access token that's been fetched from the network asynchronously. We don't need to know that, but it does. Uh, and if it's a valid access token, then just return the one that we have. Uh, great, because it's valid. Okay, so at this point, uh, down here, we know that the token is valid because we just validated it and fetched a new one if we had to, and now we can perform the actual request that we want to make. This is really cool because we can put this code in one spot to centralize the access token. Access tokens in OAuth are like the biggest headache of calling an API and we can centralize them in one spot so we don't have to worry about it throughout the rest of our code base. 
The benefits of this are that the token is not validated until it's actually needed. So if you uh, create the observable and then you don't actually subscribe to it until like five minutes later and the token's expired in that time, that's okay, it'll deal with it. Uh, we have injected some new behavior to validate and fetch new access tokens into an existing networking pipeline. And we've done that transparently to the outside user. No one really knows or has to know that this happens, uh, which reduces the incidental complexity to using OAuth. Now, whoever's using our API can do it without knowing OAuth even exists. Good for them. If you're interested in this, uh, we wrote a library called Moya. Um, it's up on GitHub. And it, uh, it's built on top of Alamo Fire, which is a really popular iOS library um, for networking. And it basically turns networking into a series of observables. And it's available for uh, RxSwift and Reactive Cocoa, so whichever your favorite FRP library is, go for it. Uh, and uh, I really like it. If you have any questions about how Moya works and the documentations don't help, then just open an issue and we'll help you out. Okay, so some of you may have seen the word flat map uh, on one of the previous slides, and maybe you might be asking, are, observable mo are observables monads? The answer to that question is we don't use the M word here. This isn't a talk about functional programming and monads. This is a talk about the, the ways that using concrete FRP can reduce the incidental complexity of building software. It's not a talk about cool theory. It's talk about how to use practical things. Theory is great, and by starting on FRP and starting to use some uh, ideas from, from functional reactive programming, you're going to expose yourself to some theory eventually, but you don't need to understand the theory in order to benefit from using functional reactive programming. Uh, if you get to the level where you like the theory, you enjoy doing it later on, great. But if you don't, that's cool too, because you don't need to understand the theory in order to benefit from using it. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a lot more that we could cover. Um, I barely scratched the surface of what observables are capable of and how they work. Um, remember the form handler, just as a very quick example. Uh, we can now have an enabled observable. Uh, it sends bools whether or not the button should be enabled. And we can combine two other Boolean observables, submitting whether or not the form is valid. We combine them into a, a tuple of uh, a submitting and valid. And then we can take that tuple and turn it into a single Boolean of whether or not the button should be enabled. And now we don't even need to invoke our callback anymore. Uh, we don't have a callback. We just have an enabled observable. So now you can't even, you know, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what would the code to actually uh, access this look like? Um, ah, shoot, sorry. Uh, that's testable, by the way, uh, this, this whole thing here. We can inject fake resetters and validators and submitters into our object using dependency injection and run a unit test to make sure that the behavior we get is what we expect to, which is really important. So that's testable. Awesome. Okay. This is what the view controller would look like. We have the form handler. We get the enabled property. We bind the enabled property to the submit button's uh, enabled state, and then we add that subscription to our dispose bag. And again, that's testable. Amazing. We can inject a fake form handler into our view controller at testing, uh, at, uh, during testing, and uh, run tests against it to make sure the behavior is what we expect it to be. My favorite way to do this is called a snapshot test. Basically what we do is we put our fake stuff in, take a picture of the view controller, and the first time we do that, we store it on disk as a PNG. And the next time we run our unit test, we do the same thing, same setup, same fake form handler, take a picture, and then compare it pixel to pixel with the original reference image. If they're different, then the unit test fails. This tells us whether or not we've accidentally changed the behavior of our view controllers. Something that iOS developers would hold up as an example, view controllers are untestable. Well, no, they're not. They're very testable. It just takes a little bit of uh, simplicity to do it. Okay. If you're interested in FRP, and I really hope you are, which I expect you are because you're at this talk, you can go on GitHub uh, slash artsy slash Eidolon. This is uh, an iOS application that we wrote. It's been in production for a little over a year. It's um, 
a kiosk. Uh, we put iPads in a physical enclosure, put them at art auctions, and users can browse through artworks, uh, tap on the ones they like, sign up, swipe their credit card, bid, everything. Uh, and it's open source, so you can go and check out all the source. There are instructions in the readme for how to download the source code and run the app against a stubbed version of the API. So you won't be able to access the private API that we need to to write the app, but you don't have to because we provided example network responses for you. Um, so if you have any questions about how any of this is written or, or why we did something a certain way, just open an issue on GitHub and we'd love to answer your questions. Maybe you have an idea, something we haven't thought of, and we can make our code base better, which would be great. Um, but in any case, we'd love to hear from you. So to wrap up, uh, programming is really a strive for simplicity, and we need to strive for simplicity because our brains don't scale. They, they can't handle a lot of things. We have between five and nine things that we can think about at once, and that's it. Second, state and managing state increases the incidental complexity of our programs. That means that it's complexity that we don't need to introduce to solve the problem. It's complexity that we're introducing unnecessarily. And third, rather than eliminate state, which is impossible, uh, we just try and abstract it away. Uh, I mean, what's the difference between eliminating state and not having access to it? And either way, I can't access state, so I'd say that FRP is as good of a, a solution to the functional programming problem than functional programming. So you might be asking, okay, great. Uh, back to the beginning, I talked about history and tools. You know, what tools are we gonna be using in the future? Is FRP gonna be the future? Well, I mean, for now, yes. In the future, maybe not, but for now, I think it is. So, thanks. So uh, if there is any question, please raise a hand. Hesh, go hand sure. Okay then, uh, oh. there. Um, my question is about optimizations because sometimes with a lot of classes, there is a lot of memory allocation that slows the process down. How can we deal with it? Using sure, that, that's a good question. Um, Memory is something that we need to be very aware of on iOS because we don't have a lot of it. Um, in the case that we saw before with the form handler, it had um, three properties, a closure and, and two other objects. Those two objects, uh, one of them does networking calls. The other ones aren't really, like they don't store things. So we're allocating memory, yes, but we're allocating a very, very small amount of memory. Um, it's possible, just like writing normal imperative code, to run into memory issues, but there's nothing inherent about FRP that introduces new memory issues. Um, if you're noticing a problem, just do exactly what you're, you're used to doing. Profile the application, find out where the memory is being used, and come up with solutions to those problems. Okay, there. A question there? Hi. Um, so how, how do you, uh, in terms of just pushing view controls and whatnot, how are you passing the model from one to another, just abstracting, abstracting it away? Okay, so are you talking about MVVM a little bit? Yeah. Okay. I didn't even mention MVVM, and this is the second time I've done this. I do an entire talk, I don't say MVVM, and then I get a question about MVVM. Like, I think I have a reputation or something. Um, what we're doing is, instead of accessing the models directly from the view controllers, we're gonna put the model inside of a intermediate object so we don't have access to its properties directly. We've abstracted this data away, awesome. So the question is really then, um, if you've tapped on like a song or something in iTunes and you're getting to the, the song detail view controller, how do we get its view controller there? Um, what's the best practice there? And I don't really have like a good answer to that because um, I mean, you can do uh, new view models vended from the original view model. You can do the view controller creates its own view model from the model object. Like, many different ways to do it, and they each have pros and cons. Um, I haven't found, like, one way that's, like, s way better than the other approaches, so I'm not really comfortable giving you a do this. Um, I would say uh, try something and then 
see the things you don't like about it, and then try and you know improve upon it with those in mind. Um, generally, what I like to do is so I've got the the uh, general view controller, and it has a view model, and we tap on something, we get a view model from that, and then inject it into our new view controller here, and then push that view controller. That's how I would generally do it. Cool. Any other questions? Well. Really? So thank you, Ash. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be right back with Paul Odnot from Mozilla uh, in just a few more minutes. Uh, if you want, you can go outside and then come back in like 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs>